How's everyone feeling today? Not too bad? That's good. That's good. Um, what I was going to do today, just to firstly just get us to start start off, and uh, is to describe some of the features, I suppose you could say, of progression, progression spiritually and emotionally on the divine love path for you. And then once we've got into that discussion, you'll probably have a lot of questions about yesterday's presentation that I'd like to answer as well. So hopefully that'll be the uh, run of the mill today. We'll just answer a lot of your questions. The reason why I wanted to firstly present the differences between the divine love path and lots of other paths is so that you can get a bit of a flavour inside of yourself about how it encompasses all of your life. You can't just do little bits and pieces of things when it comes to God. God expects, and you could say God has designed her universe in such a way that if you want to come to her, there is only one way to do it. And this one way in, in, encompasses all areas of your life. There's not a single area of your life that will not be touched by progression uh, using the, on the divine love path. And so what I'd like to do is describe some of the different way, areas of that of your life that are going to be affected and describe some of the different areas that we can see a lot of the other paths don't incorporate. And the reason why is because on the earth today we have a lot of spiritual paths, literally millions really, of spiritual paths, and many of them incorporate aspects of different parts of what God actually designed the universe to be. So all of them have bits and pieces of truth, if you like. And the difference between the divine love path and all of these other paths is the divine love path of progression has the absolute truth. And the absolute truth, of course, is going to incorporate all of these little bits of truth. So you'll notice, oh, that's very similar to the Buddhist path there, and that's very similar to the Hindu way of doing things, and that's very similar to the Muslim way of doing things, that's very similar to the Christian way of doing things, that's very similar to the New Age things that we've learned. But all, all of it is incorporated, but not, not all of the factors of those different paths are incorporated, only the truths of those paths are incorporated, if that makes sense. So what you finish up getting is this whole life experience that is incorporated and, got, and your connection with God will change your entire life completely. It actually not only changes your life, but it actually physically changes your, your, your soul and your spirit body and your material body. So, for example, on all the natural love paths, they often talk about the seven chakras, for example, right? And in terms of keeping all of these chakras open and progressing that way. On the divine love path, there is actually more chakras that your body starts to develop. And after a while, once you become at one with God, I think there's 13 chakras once you become at one with God, not seven anymore. And so your, even your spirit body changes. And so, um, and while I haven't remembered everything about how it all changes and everything because of my own emotional suppression about my own fears that I'm working my way through now, the reality is that uh, the, phys the physical body changes. What, what will happen on the divine love path is your physical body will start releasing its ailments. Right? And you'll get to the point where you have no ailments. No sickness, no disease at all. But when you're going through different emotions, those ailments will flare up until you've released them. And so you get this cycle of things going on even with your body, your physical body, where your physical body makes adjustments and changes. So my body has made huge changes um, over the five or six years that I've been really focused on doing everything again. And the body has just changed immensely. You also have, you will also find yourself that in the first entry I said the eyes are the window into the soul. And you, when you look in a mirror, any of you done iridology? Yeah, got a few. So when you look into a mirror, you'll notice these blemishes and specks in your eyes all the way around the iris and, and in the coloured section. And you will notice even that clears up. You'll notice all of that, which is a reflection of what's clearing up in your body. So what happens is even your eyes become very, very clear and the more clear they become, the more you know you're releasing emotional injuries as well. And eventually they become so clear that if you take a photo of it, it's just all one colour without blemishes at all. And when you become at one with God, there is no blemishes at, at all in the iris of your eye. 
for example. You know how most of you have done some reflexology at some point, like had a you know foot, foot, foot reflexology. The same applies there. You know that there's these pressure points, right, that you can press and it can release or connect to different parts of your body and release different emotions if you allow that to occur. Well, on the divine love path, you get to the point where there's no sensitive places on your feet at all, right? Where there's no where you can press any pressure point and nothing nothing hurts. How many of you have done their deep tissue deep tissue massage, for example? Yeah, quite a few. With deep tissue massage, the idea is to get right, right deep into, and it can be quite painful when you're getting it done, can't it? And and if you allow your emotions to rise, you'll be crying or whatever. I remember the first time I came out, there was this lady in Dallas who did uh, my first three and a half hour session. She gave me a deep tissue massage, and I just screamed and cried the entire session. And when I came out, my whole body was black and blue with bruises. Uh, my whole body. And uh, it took a week before those bruises disappeared. Now, if she had done the same... Uh, in the last session I did with her, she did the same things and and the first half of the session was really incredible because I was still in this terrible pain with different parts of my body. And then all of a sudden I went through this barrier of fear and then I came out and what she, she was still doing the deep tissue stuff and it felt pleasurable. And I couldn't believe it all of a sudden, just by something clicking inside of me about fear and all of a sudden now my body responded differently to what she was doing. And it was just a state that I was temporarily in at that point. But it helped me also understand how you can be in that state and there's memories that I have of being in that state obviously from the first century and it helped me just connect with those memories of being in that state in a permanent way where there is no fear in your body. Now on the divine love path it incorporates that as well. So so if you can think of almost every single thing you've done, spiritual practice, physical body repair, health and all these other things of, uh, uh, that affect your life, and then if you look at all the spiritual side and the moral side as well and all the things you may have done there, what happens in the end is the Divine Love Path incorporates all of these in certain, all of these things in certain ways as you would expect if it was connected to God when you think about it. Because obviously if we're connected to God then we're going to learn the truth about our soul, our spirit body and our material body. And not just guessing about it, we will come to know the truth about it, how it actually works in every single way. And in the first century I said the words, if you follow, if you, if you long for divine love, if you long for God's love, if you long for a connection with God, all these other things that you're seeking will be added to you. And what I meant was, your health will be added to you. Your eyesight will repair itself and be added to you. And all these other things will be added to you. So, so eventually what will happen is these things will disappear as you progress on the path. Right? And then all of the ailments of the body will disappear. If you have any body distortions because of emotions due to your growing up, they will disappear. So some of you might grow a few inches taller, for example, right? because of the different things that occur in the body as a result. And because in the end, all of these things are all affected by the emotions that the soul is storing. So on the divine love path, you could think of God's way, so we're just, uh, has a lot of different facets that we could start looking at. Um, for example, on God's path, one of the major facets is that we're going to look, have to look at absolute truth. So we have to get away from this concept that my truth is paramount. So on the, on the very many natural love ways, and particularly in the New Age movement today, this is very prevalent, there's this constant viewpoint that my truth is the most important thing. As long as I stay in my truth, everything else will work. Now, there is a truth to that concept. And the truth is that if you stay in your truth, you are being more, having more integrity. And integrity is a very, very important part of your progression. But just because you're staying in your truth, it doesn't mean that your truth is God's truth about a certain issue. So for example, I may believe with all of my heart and all of my intellect 
that if I go to war, I can go to war under certain circumstances. So the circumstance might be if I'm being attacked. I can go to, I've decided inside of myself emotionally that I can go to war if I'm being attacked and I can defend myself. So I have this viewpoint inside of myself and I feel it's a truth that I'm allowed to defend myself when I'm being attacked. Well, on the divine love path, when you connect with God, you come to realize that that's not a truth anymore. If you defend yourself, you are actually breaking some laws of love. Right? Now, most of us, when we first hear that, we go, oh, but what about this situation? What about that situation? What about, you know, and we start listing these kind of situations where we feel impelled to defend ourselves, but that's our truth. We feel that we couldn't defend ourselves, but, on, but if you want to become at one with God, you'll get to a point where you never defend yourself again from attack. You may leave a place, but you'll never defend yourself. That's why in the first century I said if someone slaps you on the cheek, just turn the other cheek, right? Implying that they may slap you again, actually, and you wouldn't defend yourself from that. And people go, well, what about self-love then? What about self-love? Well, there's a whole aspect of self-love where self-love doesn't compromise love of the other. So if I, if you slap me, you're not being loving to me. I agree. But if I slap you, am I being loving to you in return? No. Now, if I love myself, I won't compromise love for you. And so there's a big principle there that I've got to actually come to apply on the divine love path. Does that make sense? And that's the principle of coming to see God's truth about every single little situation, event and everything in my life. Now, the way I do that is once I release the emotional reason inside of myself, firstly, that causes me to attract you slapping me, then I'm going to get a slapped a lot less. <laughs> that's number one. Secondly, once... Once I do that, some body still might come up and slap me. But when they slap me, I don't feel any more physical pain from the experience, aside from just the initial pain. There's no other pain because there's no fear associated with the event. That's number two. And thirdly, there's no emotional rage that rises in me, saying, what have you done to me? Because I love myself completely, and so therefore I don't have any response of rage in return to the other person. So that's number three. And can you see, by the time I start applying, and I've only listed three of the principles involved in that interaction, by the time I start applying the principles that I feel inside of myself emotionally once I'm connected with God, I am not going to respond in defence to anyone and I am going to be perfectly happy within myself about that. I won't feel the need. So let's apply that to a relationship. I go into the relationship. The person yells and screams at me, which is a an attacking emotion that I'm getting from them, right? I'm on the receiving end. If I've developed in these areas, I won't feel that even as an attack. Now, I'm not saying that I'm intellectually jumping over all of this because the truth is that you can zen out and jump over a lot of things that happen to you. The whole Buddhist path, for example, is, a, is about that, the path of meditation Connection with self, disconnection from desire, disconnection from, uh, a lot of times, disconnection from a, your own emotional response. And what happens there is you can zen out for what people go to you. You can explain it. You can reframe it in your mind and make the emotion go away. I'm not suggesting to do that. What I'm suggesting is don't reframe anything in your mind. Feel the emotion fully and the emotion will go away and it will never return. You'll never have to do that again. So what's another aspect of the, the God's way is regard to emotions. Emotions need to be fully experienced in order to be released. Now, a lot of different paths on, on the planet talk about emotions, don't they? So they talk about emotion. So you've, have many of you heard of EFT, for example? Emotional Freedom Technique. Yeah? Okay. 
So this is where you do the tapping thing in different parts. There's different pressure points of your body. If you're an acupuncturist or something like that, you would know many, the many hundreds of pressure points in the body, many hundred points where you can release certain things. And you can actually tap certain places in your body and cause yourself to actually get out of the emotional response. Right? Now, while that may look very attractive as a means to actually deal with certain emotions, um, firstly, do you think a celestial spirit goes around tapping their body to deal with a certain thing? Well, no, they don't. Right? What they do is they fully experience their emotions, and because they've fully experienced all emotion, all the negative emotion in their body that created the initial response is gone, and because that's gone, there's no need to tap anything anymore. Can you see the difference? So when I fully experience and release an emotion, I do not any longer have a need to do something to my body to skip over that emotion, to actually even to access an emotion, because that is all released. So emotions is a very important part. Now, many of you would have heard of, um, what, what are there? There's Brandon Bay's stuff, um, journey work. There's um, the EFT type thing. There's There's lots of different... Emotional, you know, emotional intelligence work that a lot of people do as well. And this, like, I've seen literally hundreds and hundreds of different things, particularly coming out recently. The reason why these things are coming out recently is because there's a whole group of spirits now cottoning on to the idea that you do need to release emotions. And if you can do that on the earth before you pass, it's going to leave you very, very free once you get into the spirit world because you have a lot of emotions released. The issue though is, that we're not often still allowing the emotional experience of these emotions. So, with emotions we become childlike. Another word is a child that you take it to a supermarket, doesn't get its own way, anger comes up, big tantrum on the floor, doesn't care who it sees it, you know, just, eh, you know, away it goes and 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 that's what a child does. Now, I'm not suggesting you crack a tantrum every time you don't get your own way, because cracking a tantrum is actually an emotional injury. Does that make sense? Of not getting your own way that you need to work through. Why don't you want to get the own way? You need to connect to that emotion. But the child doesn't have to think about it. If You know, I don't know if you've ever tried it, because most people don't try it in a supermarket. And the child's there kicking and screaming on the floor, you know, cracking the tantrum, or in the, you know, a lot of times you see it in the trolley, you know, they're sitting in the trolley, ah! like trying to reach for the lollies, right? And and like a lot of parents just quickly go past the lolly aisle, you know, or don't even, you know, look up to the signs, no, lolly aisle, we bypass that and we walk down it later sort of thing, which is an avoidance of the child's emotion. But if we go down the lolly aisle and the child starts screaming, if you allow the child to scream and scream and scream, and this is why it isn't often done nowadays, because everybody starts looking at you and judging you and what they doing, what they doing, strangling that child or something. And so they don't do that. But if you allow the child to scream and scream, the child will go through a period where they go into this anger, rage, not getting my own way, which is the emotional injury. They're experiencing the effects of the emotional injury that they hold within them. Then they go into this place of crying in a deep, really um, sobbing way. And once they get in there, they're now, they're now processing the emotional injury that actually created their need to demand things from you. And they might stay in that place. The screaming might take an hour, so this way isn't usually done in the shopping centre, and the crying might take 20 minutes or so. But afterwards, you'll find the child will just have released that emotion completely and you won't even notice them demanding anything from you anymore. Right? Now, we've actually tried that. Mike's been with me in a car trying that with a young fellow that we both know, Mike's stepson. And uh, and it took him uh, just a bit over two and a half hours, there were six people in the car, it took him a bit over two and a half hours to do the tantrum thing first. So everyone in the car, we were driving from uh, Miami to Cape Canaveral, everyone in the car had put up two and a half hours of screaming and deal with their own emotions about that which was very interesting in itself. 
And in the first part, he was screaming, yelling, cursing everybody, swearing, you know, not swearing because he doesn't know the words yet, but, but just, uh, ta- you know, saying that I'm terrible, I hate you, I hate you, and then saying to his mummy, I hate you, mummy. And he just went on and on and on. And as each person dealt with their emotions, he eventually got into the core emotion and processed that core emotion. And straight after that, he was amazingly loving, right? In fact, when he was bought some strawberries, he shared them all with everyone in the car and all this, all this automatically happened. And this is the thing that we often do ourselves is we don't allow even our child to experience that. So we therefore are never going to allow ourselves to experience that. Right? And yet, it, when you hit the spirit world, this is the experience you're going to have if you want to be on the divine love path. You're going to need to connect with every single causal emotion inside of yourself and release it. So, the idea is to start doing that now. Now, there are many paths of spiritual progression on the earth that are already saying that to you, that are already saying you need to do with your emotional work. So that is one facet of getting to God, doing this emotional work. Then there's another facet. This is a facet that's not often... Considered, particularly on earth. In the spirit world, it's something that's known very, very well. But here on earth, we have a tendency to skip over. Although, if you look in every single spiritual path on earth that talks about God, generally there's a whole lot of you must, you must not list of things you t- to do. Does that make sense? So you must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you know, and so on forth. And, you know, we often refer to them, if we come from a Christian background, as the Ten Commandments, you know. I practice the, you know, I've quite often heard from people, I practice the Ten Commandments. That's all I need to do in my interactions with others. And that is a part of coming to God, to be frank. Practicing morals. But God's perspective on morals and our perspective on morals are very, very different. Our perspective on morals is, as long as we act moral, then it means we are moral. Most of the time, that's what we believe. Right? So, as long as I don't murder, I'm fine. That means that I'm free of that murderous emotion, if you like. No, it doesn't, actually. How many times do you think, once you get into a rage, you feel like throttling someone? And how many times do you feel like actually murdering them, even? Like, and the only reason why you don't is they're not there in front of you, number one. Number two, that there's no weapon to do it with, or or number three, that you just know that if you do that, you'll get put in jail yourself, or you'll get condemned yourself, number four. So, so, you know, as we go through the different reasons why, we start seeing actually that we do have murderous emotions inside of ourselves that we just don't act upon, right? With God's view of morals... The murderous emotion is what needs to be released. So instead of having a list of you must nots that I actually do, there is actually, from God's perspective, you could say some you must nots that you have to actually feel, not just not do. You have to actually feel them. So in other words, when I notice inside of myself that I have a murderous emotion towards somebody, On God's path, I need to look at the underlying emotional reason why I have this emotion and I need to get to that emotion and release it before I can progress. Now, you think about it. If I have had somebody hurt me and hurt me a lot in my past, getting to those kind of emotions is a pretty like difficult process, but it is something that is essential on the divine love path. Right? So there's this morals effort. We remember yesterday in our discussion, uh, we were raised about the morals of a lot of spiritual paths being very like focused on free sexuality. And that's one area that, that on God's path, you won't, you'll have to deal with those emotions, whatever is going on there. Right? God designed you to be completely sexual, but within a framework of love inside of yourself. Which brings us to this other part, the sexual part of your life. Now, on the divine love path, 
eventually you will come into a com- complete and permanent sexual union with your soulmate. What that means is that there will be permanent sexual feelings flowing back and forward between you. And when you're in the soul union state, that is like an orgasmic feeling 24 by 7, if you like. Uh-huh. So you will have this complete sexual union happening all the time in your life. Now, to get to that place means working your way through intergender emotional injuries about the opposite sex and about how you feel about your own body and your own sexuality. Now, for many of us, that's like a minefield, isn't it? Like you look back at the different relationships you've had and the hurt you got from this person or the hurt you got from that person or you look at the, you know, how your mum and dad think about things. There are many gay men or women who are not even ready to even tell their mum and dad, let alone somebody else, that they're gay. Or in fact, they find it probably easier to tell somebody else other than their mum and dad that they're gay because there's a lot of judgment and a lot of criticism about sexuality. There's a lot of shame. We're going to have to work through all of those emotions on the divine love path. And to be frank with you, it's quite like enjoyable to work through them because every emotion you release causes you to be more connected with yourself, more connected to your own desires and more connected to later on if you're not, if you're single, later on in a partnership, more connected to your partner. But we have so many intergender injuries and we have them multi-generationally, you know. Each generation has this really deep, deep issues with regard to sexuality. And would someone just like to open the door there for that lady who wants to get in? Thank you. They're both locked, are they? Yeah. If you... Yeah, no worries. All right, so can you see that if I'm wanting to progress on the divine love path, this is an area of my life that I'm going to have to heal. Because God created you as a sexual being. So a lot of people have this viewpoint of spirituality that it's not holy to be sexual. But you think about what people say about my life in the first century. What do they basically say? That I was a virgin all my life. Right? Not true. <laughs> like, I was a virgin till I met my soulmate and then we made love. Right? So, what, ha- what happens is that on this divine path you will need to heal these particular issues within yourself, heal these particular sets of injuries. Now, we can't just skip over them. We're not going to be able to skip over our sexual injuries. Right? When, when I say skip over them, you know, what, one way we skip over them is we find a nice man or a nice woman who doesn't trigger us too much. And then what we do, you know, for example, if I'm a lady who only wants to have sex once a month, right? Now, now compare that to 24 by 7 orgasm. Like You can see where you're headed, 24 by 7 orgasm, and you only want to have sex once a month. right? So there's some injuries in there. Does that make sense? That need to be dealt with in between that gap, right? Now, now, if I'm in that state, I'll be very, very tempted to find a man who feels that sex is unholy or something like that, that, that sex is a bad thing, and I will connect with him because he feels nice and safe and secure and he feels like he's got everything together sexually, you know, he loves my soul, he doesn't just love my body, all that kind of thing going on. In other words, he's working around my emotional sexual injuries. And so it feels good. I can have a safe relationship with the man. We have a wonderful relationship. We have a wonderful partnership. And my question would be, yes, but... Are you headed for 24 by 7 orgasm? Is that what you're headed for? If that's not what you're headed for, then, and you don't want to get there, then look at the emotional injuries. There's something going on. You see, on the path to God, you're going to have to look at those emotional injuries, whatever those are. Now, then on the other side of that sexual coin, if we could call it, a lot of men have the injury that it doesn't really matter what partner they have sex with, you know. uh, As long as they have sex, everything's fine, right? Well, that's another set of emotional injuries. So they think 24 by 7 orgasm sounds pretty good, right? But the problem is they don't care who it's with. 
right? And there are a lot of moral sexual injuries involved with that that they'll need to work their way through because actually God designed you to have a sexual relationship with one person in the end. That would be this 24 by 7 relationship, if you like. And it's an incredible state to be in. But it takes work, working through different emotional injuries. So you can see morals, emotions start tying into the sexual side of our life and we start needing to deal with different things. Then there's this whole other area that we have called free will. Remember I said yesterday that on the divine love path, the, the secret, one of the secrets of the universe is God designed you to have free will. That means God designed your partner to have free will too, by the way. Not just you, you know. And so, so what that means is that I will actually honour the free will of my partner. Now, what if my partner decides she wants to have sex through one of her injuries with someone else? Well, I'm going to honour the free will of my partner. Now, that's pretty challenging, isn't it, in that situation to do that? That would be very challenging. What if my partner even just wants to do something like, I want to go sailing, I'd love her to come along, but she doesn't want to go sailing, she wants to knit for the day, whether that is the case or not. <laughs> She's allowed to do that and I'm allowed to do what I want to do. And I need to deal with my emotions about that in the partnership. What happens if, uh, if I have a lot of desires in terms of... And again, again, by the way, this also means, this free will thing means, even if the other partner's desires are in disharmony with love, I need to allow them to take those actions. Now, I'm not saying that I have to stay around while they do it, right? I'm just saying that my love of free will would enable my partner. So, my partner does things for me automatically, like maybe every night she makes me a meal. After the third night, I'm starting to feel to myself, well, is this really what she wants to do every night? You know, if I love my partner and I love this aspect of free will, I have to start asking myself that question. Is she really exercising her free will or does, does she think that's her role? Because role isn't free will anymore, is it? As soon as I put myself in a box and create a role, I am now not got the freedom of expression. Right? So I'd have to ask myself, am I enabling my partner's free will? Yes, we both need to eat, but what's stopping me from cooking tonight? aside from the fact that maybe I can't cook very well and might need a few lessons, right? Can you see how we need to work our way through those issues on the divine love path as well? Then we've got issues of what you would call natural love. Remember we said yesterday that the divine love path incorporates natural love. So we've got issues of, all right, how am I practicing love in my life? Is it loving for me to yell at my children, no matter what they've done? What do you feel? See, most of us feel, when we feel about it, we feel, no, no, that's not loving. But when, when we're in the situation, you know, where your child is so frustrating and annoying and just keeps badgering you, you know, in the situation, it's totally different, isn't it? You get in the situation and before you know it, you're smacking a child and, you know, you just broke one of your own personal rules, you know, of, uh, of, of violence towards another person. So on the divine love path, we would have to incorporate these principles of natural love in our life. And that in itself is going to be quite challenging. Can you see? Quite challenging to do that. But what is a loving thing to do? Now, natural love also has this aspect of natural love towards your environment. So I would start have to, having to look at th all sorts of issues inside of myself with regard to the environment. With regard to the environment, I'd have to say, say to myself, um, how do I feel about the animals? How do I feel about the birds? How do I feel about the fish? And I say, oh, I just love the animals. You know, my dog, I just love my dog and my cat, I just love my cat. Okay, well then, why is there meat sitting on your table if you love animals so much? 
There's a whole different area there to work your way through with regard to natural love on the divine love path. Because if you loved creatures so much, do you think you'd kill them to put them on your table? And and if you really took personal responsibility, which is the next thing I'd like to raise on the path, if you really took personal responsibility, you would actually have to kill that animal. So if any of you try doing that, just slitting the throat, skinning it, gutting it, but for most of us we'd be totally, our stomach would be churning if we, for most of us. And to be frank, I don't know if you've ever gone along to an abattoir's, but what a, I've been to a number, and the men in there are so detuned because they've had to detune themselves from the whole process. And they are so detuned from anything to do with flesh and, and pain and a lot of other things too. So on the divine love path, we need now to start taking personal responsibility for the actions that we get other people to do for us because we don't want to do it for ourselves. So I need to start taking personal responsibility for the fact that I want this meat on my plate. Can you see? The personal responsibility issue there. I need to take personal responsibility for the fact that I want a great big house and two cars in the garage and, and all of these other things which actually have a big impact on the environment. I need to start taking some personal responsibility. I need to even take personal responsibility for the things I eat. The things that I eat that are disharmonious with love. Because there are things you can eat that are disharmonious with love, by the way. Animals, of course, is one of them. You know, because you've got to kill it to eat it. And uh, it's a living creature. And you'll start feeling your emotions about all that. Remember, the emotions are going to be incorporated into all of this. Can you see now we're starting to... There's all these different ways. You, 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 can, you can sort of incorporate... Many of these different things are in different forms of religion or the New Age stuff and all those kind of things. Many of them are in that. But now we're starting to bring them all together and incorporate them into our life in a true way. We also have this other, these other issues too with regard to spirits. In other words, or the afterlife you could think of it as. So we come to start realizing in a, in a, in a way, which is some of the paths have done this, haven't they? Like the Buddhist path has done this, the um, New Age path has done this where they start realizing there's a whole lot of things going on out there in a different dimensional spaces that influence us, that people actually come and influence us. And we start seeing the relationship between spirits and ailments in my own body and the connection between the law of attraction and all those kind of things. We start noticing all that on the divine love path. And we start feeling them around us. Whoa, that feels a bit strange. You know, that feels a bit... You can walk into a room and, you, and nobody's in it and you know somebody's in there. <laughs> and you feel that. Many of you have already done that, but you become more and more aware of that as time goes on, of what their energy is and what their emotions are and what's going on for them and how that emotion has been attracted to your emotion and how that works. So you start connecting with these spirits a bit more. You start actually even being able to talk to them about their stuff. And they talk to you about their, their stuff and you can talk to you, them about your stuff. And you start realizing that, wow, my dad that's passed, he's been around me all this time after he passed. I thought when he abused me when I was little that now that he's dead and gone, it's great. But he's actually been hanging around me all this time. And you start realizing that you've still got emotions to work through about that. And when you start working through those emotions, he starts working through some emotions about that. You know? Initially he might be angry and then he goes into this facing the fact that he did what he did and goes into sadness or grief just by you living in truth, you know, just by you living in the truth of that. Can you see how, how and I can start listening all sorts of things. Um, we can start having the mics, so um, just down here, Tris. If you put up your hand so that Tris can see where you come, he's coming from the back. Just 
So are you saying that when, when, you know, like my mother and my father die, that their spirit stays around me? Um, it depends on what type of attractions you have between you and them as to whether they stay around you. So any time you think of them, um, if they feel that you think of them, let's say your mum has this emotion of, I was a good mother, I was a good mother inside of her, and you think of her just in an instant and you think of something she did to you that was actually not very nice. Right? So that's the feeling you have inside of you. Oh, she didn't treat me very nice in that particular instant. She will feel, she will know in the spirit world that that's happened inside of you and she'll feel drawn to come to you and tell you that she's a good mother, just like she used to do when she was on earth, right? If that was the emotion. I was a good mother to you. Don't you go blaming me for things that are your problem. <laughs> do you know what I mean? She might do that from the spirit world. And if you're sensitive to that, which you will be on the divine love path, you'll start feeling that emotionally, right? That. So that gives me the opportunity of looking at my own resistance within? Exactly. Yeah, it gives you really good opportunities for you to work through the emotion of it, but it also gives her opportunities to actually acknowledge that actually in that particular instant she wasn't a good mother, that she'd actually acted upon other emotions that she had that weren't very nice that actually damaged you in that particular instance. Does that make sense? So it gives her the opportunity to work through those things. So you start understanding on the divine love path that actually just because a person's passed, it doesn't mean that they're out of your life. And you start also understanding things about like death, that actually there is really no such thing. And you come to actually release the emotions that are related to grief. And you no longer grieve when someone you love passes because they're still there and you can feel them. And you don't grieve them anymore. You can still have a relationship. Just two things. Tris, sorry. AJ, do animals have a spirit body and a soul also? Uh, animals don't have a soul, but they have a spirit body. So, so, um, and animals, uh, and this is a very important thing to understand, that the animal is actually relating to your soul. So an injury in your soul. So sometimes when an animal goes into attacking mode, it's because of a injury in the person they're trying to attack that is maybe fearful. And many of you have noticed that, that if you're afraid of a dog, then a dog seems more inclined to bark at you and be upset with you. They're feeling your fear and responding and reflecting that back to you. And that is a natural thing in all of the plant life and all of the animal life on this planet. They all reflect back at you your emotion. So you will find that with animals, and, and particularly you know dogs and, or domesticated animals, they're actually reflecting your emotion constantly. Now, there's been many studies about this, on scientific studies, where you know a man who's had a dog at home, he goes to work. When he leaves work and goes home, the dog waits at the door as he's leaving work. The dog knows that he's leaving work. right? And then he changes his timetable. There's a study, BBC did one, didn't they? The dog changed, the, the, the man changed his timetable about leaving work. The dog still knew when he was leaving work and so waited at the door waiting for him to come home. So animals are very, very sensitive to us emotionally when they're connected to us and less so when they're wild, but they're still very sensitive emotionally. They have a spirit form, but they don't have a soul. But because they just have a spirit form and not a soul, they can grow with us through our life, even if we're in the spirit world. So when they pass over, when a really loved animal passes over, it often is still around us here on earth and it waits until we pass. Right? And that's what happens to many domestic animals. So we pass, we'll be welcomed not only by the people we know but also by the animals that we still love. Right? Uh, can you microphone we need? Uh, I, I'm just curious with the uh, emotional re release and free will and moral that you talk about. So are you trying to say that uh, God actually condone murderous intent or torturous thought? Like you know, if you if you want if you hate someone and you need to release that emotion to like kill him or things like that. So. All right, yeah. Well, can I answer that after a little bit more? I've talked about this particular issue because I want to answer your question in full, which I haven't done yet. The, the issue with regard to animals is that when you work through different emotions, your animals will respond to you in different ways. 
And so they're like our little, they're like children really in the way that they respond to our emotions. So yes, animals do have a spirit body. They do not have a soul, but we often feel like they have a soul because they're actually responding to our emotion. Right? And by the way, it's our suppressed emotions that also that they're responding to, or our denied emotions. And that's the thing that you often notice. So myself and Mary often walk up our path. We've got a 40 acre property out in the bush. And we walk up our path, days that we're not afraid, the animals, the kangaroos and everything come right up close to us. We've got these little joeys at the moment that are just bouncing around the house and whatever else. And on the days we're not afraid, they all come out and bounce around. These little, you know, joeys come out and out, out of mum. They're not afraid at all. They're wild kangaroos. But as soon as we come up from our tent afraid, we don't hardly see any of them at all, or we walk out the door and they're off just because of our emotion. Does that make sense? Now getting back to your question, with regard to what's happening with emotional processing, God gave us free will. So God gave you the will, the ability to decide anything you want to do. But God also set up a whole series of laws that have consequences. And rather than thinking of them as punishments, they are actually consequences. Every time I break a law, there will be a consequence for the breaking of that law. Now, the highest of these laws is the laws of divine love. They're the laws of God's love. And whenever I break one of those laws, there is an automatic consequence or you could, inside of my own soul where I will experience pain. The problem on earth is that we often have detuned so much from the pain that we don't notice the pain growing inside of ourselves emotionally. And it's only when we pass over into the spirit world that we have a look in the mirror and we see this very, very gross, distorted body. So a murderer, for instance, who passed over into the spirit world would pass into one of the lowest spheres of the spirit world, the first sphere, and he'll pass into a plane of the first sphere which is very, very deep and dark. And there are literally thousands of planes in the first sphere and the bottom of those planes is very dark and very, uh, in fact, there's hardly any light at all. And there's lots and lots of terrible emotions in that place. And so a murderer, when he first passed, he would look in the mirror and see this body that's, that actually disgusts even himself. And he will actually live in this place until he works through the emotional reasons why he committed the murder. Uh, you'll need to use the microphone, so you need to... All right. So, um, then, how how are you going to prevent a murderer from uh, releasing his murderous intent, or how are you going to like prevent someone who uh, has this uh, torturous uh, thought towards a person? Good. Um, the only God doesn't prevent them, so you are not going to be able to prevent them either. And uh, sorry, uh, I know this might sound a bit off. Uh, that's why we have the Ten Commandment. The Ten Commandment is to um, is to show you how sinful you are in the in, in the sense that you can't uh, control your murderous thought or your lustful intent, and well, therefore you need the this is what I'm getting at. Christ. This is what I'm getting at. Yeah. Is that if you release the emotion inside of you that creates the murderous thought or murderous intent, you will no longer have it ever. But you will have them kill someone. You will have them murder and torture someone. Yes. You're saying that... What, what are you saying, though? No, you are saying that uh, you have to... You, t you say that you have to release the murderers... Not by acting upon it. <laughs> okay. I'm not saying by acting okay. upon it. <laughs> yeah. right. Acting Act upon it, and this is the assumption you're making. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm saying you need to feel your underlying emotional reason why you want to do it. Uh -huh. You don't release your emotions by acting upon an emotion that's unloving. You release your emotions by connecting to the underlying emotional reason why you want to do that particular thing. But, yeah, but if you have a negative intention or evil thought, then that means you have in a way, committed murder up in your mind. That's correct. Or torture up in your mind. That's correct. And, and that you need to release the emotional reason why you've had that thought. Okay. If and you want to come to God. 
Yeah, and, and, and how, how do you release it? By, by connecting to the underlying emotion, and the underlying emotion might be that you've been harmed a lot by other people, mm -hmm. and, or that you feel terrible about yourself. It could be, there could be literally, with regard to a murder, there literally could be hundreds of different types of emotions that causes a person to murder. The key is to not act in harmony with an unloving thing. Remember I said we must mm. also act in mm. harmony with love. Mm. So we don't act in harmony with an unloving desire, yep. but what we do is we feel the emotion of the unloving desire fully. So I would go out to my boxing bag and get a bat, baseball bat and yell and scream mm. and swear and bash and mm. just connect to the emotion. And after I do that, drop down into the uh, grief. And when do I drop down into the grief of that? then I'll be crying about whatever it is that caused me to be so upset about that particular person. Just, I want to yeah, ask, yeah. Mary wants to ask, answer a few things about it too. Yeah, I, I think it's a really valid question because I think uh, uh, if somebody's new that they don't quite understand the difference between a causal emotion and an effect emotion. Yeah. And definitely when someone wants to murder or torture or or harm another, they're, they're already acting in an avoidance of some of their own personal pain. They're really denying their own personal pain. So there's a common assumption on the earth that some people are just murderous and some people are just evil, if you like, but um, my belief is that that's not the case. Those people are really um, trying to avoid a deeper causal emotion within them and all anger is actually an avoidance of those kind of emotions, yeah. So all anger and rage is an avoidance technique. Not You're not actually dealing with your emotions yeah. when you're uh, in that state. Right. Um, the, the thing is now, this may sound a bit off, but um, you have some people who believe that the reason why uh, some, uh, say, murderer or uh, serial killer, rapist, the reason why they can't control themselves is because they have a dark, twister, like, you know, satanic or demonic uh, entity within them. That is true. Yeah. Some but, and, but, can I just explain, a spirit who is a dark mm -hmm. spirit, an entity who is dark, may connect to us, but if we deal with our causal emotion, that spirit cannot cause us mm -hmm. to murder. And in, in order for a person to do that, he needs the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of Lord Jesus Christ moving within them? Like well, the truth is that we don't need it. Um, the truth is we can deal with our emotions without God, but it is much harder to deal with our emotions without God. And so this is why on the divine love path, when you're connecting to God, you realize you've got to deal with your emotions that are murderous or, or, or angry and rageful and all those emotions, but you actually get to the underlying emotion and the way you do it is always feeling your connection with God and and as you do that, what happens is you sink down into the underlying emotion instead of trying to express the denial emotion. The denial emotion is always things like rage, anger, abusing others, hurting others, even yelling at others is all not, not on the divine love path. When you're doing all of those things, you are now out of harmony with God and you're now denying emotions within yourself. I just, I have a, um, I'd really love to be able to explain to this uh, gentleman about causal and capping emotions and how the law of attraction works in our life and how we can release emotions. It's a big thing I want to explain. Um, how we can release emotions without God, but how it is assisted when we involve God mm -hmm. um, and how spirits work in our law of attraction. <laughs> so do you want to come up and do all of that? <laughs> Mary's afraid. So, uh, you feel I'll do it better, but you're the one who wants to answer. <laughs> so, what if we uh, rub this? What it, does, does everyone just for a moment just get this? The that the fact that the divine love path is going to incorporate all these avenues of development is. It's not, you're actually going to bring together lots of the different things you've learned over your life about things into one way of progression towards God. And that's what's going to happen on this path. Does everyone sort of understand and, and grasp that? So, all right, we'll rub that off and then Mary can go and explain the difference between causal emotion and capping emotion and so forth. The way, the way I feel about um, the way God created the universe is that he created us as emotional beings. 
that that and everything is responding to this all powerful soul that we have which is actually an emotional part of us um it's got lots of other things about it but in essence it's it's emotional and all of our intellect just is an extension of this emotional state that we are just um, wanting a bit further apart than this. Yeah. <laughs> um and so God also created a lot of laws in our universe so that we could come to understand this truth about ourselves. And one of those laws is the law of attraction. Now, a lot of people think that the law of attraction acts around the way we think about things, um, but it's actually based on our emotions. And God created the law of attraction and the law of desire so that when we when we're in a um, a pure, loving state where we don't have any emotional injury, we attract everything that we desire, everything that we want and we need in our life. The problem happens that when we're children, we're not allowed to be this emotional being that we are because everyone around us isn't in that state either and so it's very confronting for them when we are emotional. So the way that God... Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> The way that God devi- well, the way that God de- designed our soul was that all emotion would just flow through it naturally. There'd be things happening in our life, and and even now in the in the world that we live in, where things are not very in harmony with love, if a child was raised in the way that they could just feel all of their emotions passing through them, even if they were painful and sad, they would actually grow into an adult with very few emotional injuries. But what happens is that we get shut down. So the way it's designed to be is like a, just a general flow that happens all the time. But when we get, when we're children and we're smacked or we're told don't, don't cry or when you cry I feel upset so don't do that. Um, or, or even worse, some abuse or something happens to us that we're not able to express to others or to deal with. The emotions come into us and they get stuck. We're not allowed to cry or scream or feel what we feel. Usually we don't have this with happy emotions because everyone's okay with us laughing and stuff like that. <laughs> but when, so we, we end up with this soul that has lots of stuff stored up in it and it can be sadness and grief, feeling unloved from the people around us. So the way, so that's an issue for us. And that then, because we're not allowed to feel our sadness, we then start to have other emotions on top of it, like anger. And as we grow into adults, we so some of the anger is childhood anger that we have there on top of our sadness because we weren't allowed to feel sad and then we felt angry about it and then we weren't even allowed to feel our anger. So that's stored within us. Then as we grow into adults, other things happen in our life and we begin to feel we begin to get triggered or we begin to have emotions stir within us. But because that's a really scary place for us, we've never experienced that before in our life, we start to have other emotions on top that are going to help us avoid those really deep blocked emotions. And some of those are also angry emotions and sometimes they can be murderous or torturous. But the way that... How am I going? Yeah. <laughs> I think you don't go. <laughs> But God designed this beautiful law called the law of attraction, which is actually a law to help us to return to this very emotional state, this very free state where we can just live in our emotions and express who we truly are. So what happens is when we have these blocked emotions within us, the law of attraction acts not on our thoughts but on these emotions. Well, it acts on all of our emotions, but... We notice it more when it acts on these emotions. <laughs> Cause what happens is, I'm just trying to think of an example. Can you think of an example? Uh, with a blocked emotion? Uh, yeah, and the law of attraction. Well, let, let's say I feel like I want to have a relationship, but, uh, I don't seem to be attracting any women into my life, right? But I want to have a relationship. The truth is that here I'm thinking I want to have a relationship. But there's an emotion in me that I feel that I'm unworthy of a relationship. So there's an, the emotion is creating my law of attraction. It's not my mind. 
I often think, oh, I'd love to have a relationship. Sometimes I even cry. Oh, it'd be lovely to have a relationship and it's sad that I don't and all those kind of things. So I'm crying and thinking that I want a relationship. But in reality, there's this feeling inside of me that might be a fear of vulnerability in a relationship that I'm not releasing. And it's that fear through the law of attraction that creates my reality. So the truth, this is what we often hear of called as subconscious emotions. Right? So the truth is that all emotions can be conscious, but, and all thoughts are, can be conscious too. The truth is that this suppressed emotion that I don't release creates my law of attraction, so therefore creates my reality. Is that a good example? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so everyone then thinks, gee, the law of attraction is pretty bad. If I feel like I'm not going to be loved by a man, I'm never going to be loved by a man. But the truth is it's actually a very beautiful law because if I'm aware of my law of attraction and I, I want to be in a relationship and I'm looking for men, I'm going out on dates and nothing ever happens, if I'm willing to feel the emotion that is being triggered within me, if I feel it to its core, I'll get down probably to a feeling about my dad. My dad was never around. I never felt loved by him. If I release that, it will actually leave me. So I'll feel it at a very childlike level and it might take me a couple of hours to have a really good cry about it. When I do that, my soul is then in a clearer condition in that one area and I'll actually start to attract a man who really loves me. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Uh, right. Um, sorry. I'm not finished, though. Okay. Can okay. I just keep yeah, going? Yeah. No problem. <laughs> so that's, that's how the law of attraction works. Yeah. Now, when it comes to feeling my emotion, if I involve God in that process, if I'm longing to God, asking for God's assistance to help me feel this emotion and help me feel some of her love, if I long for God in that process, it will speed up the process. So that emotion will leave me a lot quicker and my law of attraction will change for the better. Now, before you mentioned about spirits, because it's very true that sometimes murderers and serial killers do have very dark spirits with them. And those people are just people who are just like us on the earth once who had a lot of blocked emotion, a lot. And they didn't know about the law of attraction, they didn't know about God, they didn't know about any of the beautiful laws of the universe. And when they passed and went to the spirit world, they, they didn't understand where they were then either. But they knew they had these awful feelings inside of them. I, I don't want to feel what's really hurting inside of me. I need to hurt, I need to rape, I need to, to kill. So what happens there in the spirit world? There's someone else on earth who has similar emotions. Through the law of attraction, that spirit comes closer to that person because God designed it that the law of attraction would bring us things that would help to trigger our emotion. So you can see why this is an important law for everyone to learn about because the person who has these deep, dark emotions who's still on the earth, if they don't know about it, then they're compelled to go and hurt another person. But if they know about the law of attraction, they realize, oh my gosh, my dark feelings are really heightening. There must be something here for me. If I'm brave enough to go into my emotion, it will be released from me. And that will actually help the spirit who is with me also. But, uh, yeah, this is very interesting. Now, the thing is, I'm just curious. Uh, so what is the source of this uh, repressing or uh, suppressing dark emotion? Like... What is uh, causing a, a person to, to experience this uh, repressed uh, emotion? It's because we all walked away from love. And, and what God. causes us to walk away from love? It's like, it's as if, you know, you have, you have people out there who are, you have some people out there who are being like brainwashed, mind control, and conditioned by their environment. And you have to ask yourself, who's the one that sort of like, you know, uh, spiritually, generate, if not uh, manipulate and create a system of worldliness where you will have people like that who will be living in a repressed emotion. Mm. So The truth is we're all living with repressed emotion at the moment. 
every single one of us in this room. So we can we can judge these people who have really dark amounts of repressed emotion within them. But the truth is a lot of us have just as much repressed emotion. We're just not acting on it. Yeah. And the so reason can that I explain it, though the re- actual original cause. Yeah. The original cause there was a time when the first human there was a first human couple by the way. And that's something we didn't discuss yesterday. Their names were Ammon and Amen. And you can speak with them in the spirit world when you pass. They are, they are, they are in the spirit world. And what happened was right at the beginning, God gave them the, this gift of free will, just like we have the gift of free will. But what they decided to do was they decided that they would be better off becoming gods. In other words, Instead of actually being God's child, which is how God created us to be, her, her children, they decided that they were going to be gods in their own right, not needing God at all in their life. So they made this big decision, they made it together, they made this big decision to deny any assistance from God. And what they what they actually did, and when you speak with them about it, they'll explain some of the emotions that rose in them. They were in a perfected natural love state, but they decided that they wanted to be God. They decided they could be God themselves. In other words, they could have their own universe. They could have their own rules. They could have, they decided all these different things. And it was a huge decision that they made. Now, as a result of that, and by the way, many of us make this decision every single day of our lives when you think about it, right? Many of us right now still make the same decision. Anyway, they made this decision to be, I suppose you could say, the rulers of their own universe, to be completely self-reliant. And so they started walking away from God. And the problem with walking away from God is we automatically start detuning from God's love. And as soon as we start detuning from love, emotions start arising within us that are disharmonious with love. And as soon as that starts occurring, then we do more things disharmonious with love. So it all comes from the from the fact that we were given this free will choice. We have the free will choice to do anything we wish. Now, a lot of people then say, well, then God made a mistake. God shouldn't have given us free will. But my feelings are, no, we made the mistake by using our free will in a manner disharmonious with love. Now, I think personally that the gift of free will is the most power, one of the most powerful gifts God has given us. And in fact, the whole point of individualization is to actually use our free will and learn how to use our free will in a way that uplifts ourselves and everyone else around us. One of the most damaging ways to use our free will is to try to damage myself or damage anyone around me. And when we do those things, we walk away from God, we walk away from love, we walk away from truth, and the only course of action from walking away from God, love and truth is a degradation of our own condition. So what happened is man started in a six-sphere state and they degraded in their condition so much that what you know as some of these like skeletal sort of men from history you know, that they've now found skeletons of, of only being this high, and in a very, very poor state, that all came about through this degradation of their emotional and soul condition. And then, so man went through this process of a devolution, a devolution instead of an evolution, where they, instead of evolving into more powerful beings, they devolved into these animal-like creatures in the end, where their primary motivations were food, sex, and that's about it. Like in, in terms of what, what they did in their entire life. Many of them lived until they were 20 or less years of age and died because they were old. Like You know how we have an old age person now, 70, 80, 90, maybe 100 years of age. Back then, an old person was 20 like in, this de- in this devolved state. And, so, and then men, because the spirits all passed and started working through their emotions, men started to have positive influences coming from the spirit world. Now that they have positive influences, they started understanding a little bit more of love and understanding a little bit more of these laws of free will and how they're damaging others. And so slowly man started to evolve again, to grow out of this really dark and dingy condition and rise out of that condition back into being what we see today, which, by the way, what we are today is still 
not what we could be. The truth is, today, every single person in this room could look 25, right? no matter how old you are. Right? That's the truth if we had dealt with lots of the emotions and it were in our fully evolved condition. But we're not yet in our fully evolved condition, but we're nowhere near what we were about a you know, hundred thousand years ago or so, or even fifty thousand years ago, in this terribly devolved, damaged condition. But the whole reason why that whole such scenario occurred was because we decided to walk away from love. We made the choice to do it. And when you think about it today, many of us still make the same choice. And we make it for lots of different reasons. A lot of times it's because we think our emotions, we don't own our own emotions, as Mary was saying, they're all blocked there within us and that causes pain. And then we, instead of feeling our emotional pain and working our way through that, I want to create pain in you as well as me. And as soon as I go into that state, I personally am devolving. I am going backwards again in my own progression through the exercise of my free will. Does that make sense? Uh, so, do you believe in the existence of Satan? Like, you know, the, no, uh, no. I, I've been in the spirit world, yeah. mm-hmm. and there is no Satan. But there are spirits who have come from Earth who are far worse than any Satan you could imagine. Mm. All right. All right. Fair enough. And by the way, there are hundreds of thousands of these spirits who are far worse than any Satan that you could draw a picture of in your own mind or see in books. Right? They are very distorted and grotesque f- physically and they also have a terrible, terrible group of emotions that mean all they want to do is destroy everything around them. And they have gone so far in denial that they're now in this terrible state. We can help them get out of it and they can still get out of it and we can help them get out of it as well. Here on earth we can help them get out of it. And in, in time we will. I feel very positive that in fact what's coming up in the next 10, 10 to 20 years means that the majority of them will get out of it. So. Um, you are right, babe? You? Yeah, I think I'm you've, done. You've done? Yeah. yeah. Um, if we could have just a lady behind you, in black, yeah. thanks. Sorry, I just want to ask you a question. As a teacher... Um, is the mic on? I just want to check with the mic's on. Sorry. Is that right? better? Yeah. As a teacher, um, how do I teach without impeding the free will of the kids in my class? Yep. Without inform- putting some controls on things. Mm. Well, um, eventually what's going to happen here on earth is that the teaching that will happen on earth is the same kind of teaching that will happen in the spirit world. And it's very, very different to what's currently happening here on earth. You see, the teaching system that's created here on earth is based around a lot of injuries in the adults of what we perceive education to be. So what do we perceive education to be? You quite often hear from rigid persons, the three, R, three R's that don't really, they're not R's anyway, what are they? Reading, Reading and writing and arithmetic. But anyway, um, so, you know, we often hear that it's just, education is just a process of the intellect. Then we also know that from books like Emotional Intelligence and other things that there's also this emotional part of the person that needs to be developed. And in fact, once we start being a teacher, and you've seen that in your own life, how you can see how the emotions in the child affect their learning. In fact, when they have the emotion, they can't learn very well at all in many cases. And so you start seeing this interrelationship between emotions and, and the, you know, the actual learning process. But then we've got this imposition from the laws or the governments and, the, and what everyone perceives to be the right thing to do that no, 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 don't worry about the emotions. Just, just make sure you get those basic skills into this person. In the spirit world, it doesn't happen like that at all. The way it happens in the spirit world is that the person exercises a desire to learn and then they're taught. Now, the way it's done is very clever, though, because there's ways to do it. The way to do it is create an environment 
that is so fascinating that the person cannot but help themselves to ask a question. Right? And so what that does inside of the soul, as soon as we're in this desire phase, as soon as we desire an answer about something, now we can be taught. So what they do in the spirit world with all the children is they have these very large places. There's a location in the spirit world in the top of the first sphere called Summerland. And they have these very, very large places that are for all the children who pass and, and still are not adults yet on their own, exercising their own free will properly at this point. And what they do is they educate them through this system of desire. So what they do is they create an entire system and an entire location that is purpose-built to attract attention in every possible way. And it's very, very fascinating. Um, and so you get these children, these little children who, who have passed, uh, who are in these locations. What happens is these children are just so fascinated, they want to ask questions. The question now, the question, you, you've been like this with your children at times, right? You're walking along the road, why is that happening? What's that plant? Why is that animal like this? And, and you get this constant series of questions. And that is the best time to teach your children, right? And so in the spirit world, that's how it's all going. That's how it's all. And there's no focus on the reading, writing, arithmetic, and all that kind of stuff, because that's all a part of it. That's all a part of it. They, when they ask the question, they show them the mass of it, or they show them, you know, the language of it, or they show them the skill of actually expressing themselves as a part of the exercise. But it's all driven by the desire of the child. So let's flick that over. So we're talking now about idealis, uh, an ideal school system, right? And by the way, when I present answers to you, all of them will be presented based on what God wants us to do and not what we're currently doing. So in an ideal system, every one of these children is allowed to experience their own emotions. So if they go through an experience of anger where they start actually dumping their anger onto another person, what happens in the spirit world is that person is scooped up by a spirit who is versed in helping this kind of this kind of problem. They they are taken away and given private help to actually work their way through that emotion. Right? Once they've worked their way through that emotion, they're allowed to go back to the location where they were with all the other children because they're no longer damaging the other children. Now. For that to occur on earth, we have to throw away money as the driving factor of education. Right? Money at the moment is one of the most damaging problems that we have on the planet. The truth is there's enough food to feed all of us, there's enough resources to all of us have shelter and all of us to have quite a lot of things on this planet. But what we do in the end is we're starting to focus on the money and the it becomes a driving force. E economy becomes a driving force of most of the things we finish up doing. Most of the things we finish up doing in health is economy driven. Most of the things we finish up doing in education is economy driven. Now if we threw away economy driven education, what we'd be able to do is have people who are able to help these children who are what we would call problem children. Now, now on the earth, why are they problem children? As you know, in every single case that you've got a child in that's unruly in your classroom, generally it's because of what's happening at home. Right? So, so it's not wise for us here on earth to just help the problem child. Because what happens, you know, the, the, we help the child cry an emotion out today, they go home tonight, get belted and slapped around and, and abused and not fed and not fed tonight, maybe fed once in the morning, and they come back to school, now they've got a whole other series of damage. So if we were in a real situation in the spirit world, that child would not be allowed to go back to those parents anymore until those parents exercised a desire to deal with their emotions that caused them to abuse that child. And those parents would actually be separated from that child in the spirit world. And of course the child goes along with it because the child wants to be not abused anymore. And they help, the child is helped then to work their way through their emotions and the parents help. And there's no like condemnation of the system up in the spirit world either for doing that. There is no condemnation of the parents for being in the condition that they're in. All that happens is everything is driven on desire. So the parents now would have to develop a desire within themselves if they want to have their child in that location because the child's will is not to be in the location where they're going to get abused. But again, what we do is economy-driven. You know, there is in, in this system, there's economy-driven. What happens if there's whole 
groups of children who don't want to be with their parents. What do we do in this society? Well, what we do is we condemn the parents for their behaviour. We even lock them up for their behaviour, which actually creates more damage to that parent and doesn't help them deal with the causal emotion. And the child is expected to go back with the parent or back to another foster family or two foster families, three, which creates all sorts of issues there as well. So we've got so many issues to change here when it comes to education that are all linked to other things other than education. And so what we need is people on the, on the planet that are actually going to be leaders in these areas. And now, with regard to education, there are already on the planet uh, some education locations where the children live there, they actually build the location where they're going to be educated and through that process they learn all things about building, self-responsibility, how to interact with others and lots of other beautiful qualities they develop and then they educate each other and the lecturer or the person who's the teacher is only there to give advice. Now in Russia there's one of those systems and they can, they actually have children who are university educated by the age of 12 years of age coming out of that system. All right. Now, so the, the, the thing is we need to start incorporating these particular things into mainstream, mainstream society. But it's going to require us changing a lot of belief systems to do it. One of them is condemning parents rather than helping parents who are abusive. We so often go into condemnation. You, you see this a lot with regard to if a pedophile goes into a certain location. What happens? You don't have, like, uh, you know, help given to them or anything like that to work their way through their causal emotion about why they're a pedophile. What you have is a hundred parents picketing their house trying to prevent them from being anywhere near their children in fear. Right? What's, what's going to solve the problem? The man dealing with causal emotion is the only thing that's going to solve the problem. So he needs to be, before he's released back out into society, he needs to be working through emotions. And once you're sensitive to emotion, you can tell when another person's worked through their emotion. And this is why for many of you, you come up and talk to me and say, oh, you've got this emotion to deal with or that emotion to deal with. And you say, oh, no, I don't. I say, yes, you do, I'm sorry. Um, because I can feel that emotion still there, right? Now, if you had like hundreds of people sensitive to that or thousands of people sensitive, you would know when a man who's a pedophile hasn't worked through his emotion. And there'd be no court system deciding that he had, you know, because you can fake a lot of things here on the planet, right, just by saying it. There would actually be feelings. Yes, five of us feel, we can feel the feeling from you still that you've got this issue with your mother to work your way through. And if that issue is driving this issue. We can feel inside of you you've got this sexual issue with children to work your way through. And we can feel that. And so you can't be released until you've worked your way through that particular emotion. So getting back to the education system, you can see that if the education system is based around desire, then it's going to work really well. It also is going to be a beautiful thing to be a teacher in that environment, right? Because you're not getting hammered by economies, you're not getting hammered by all of these different governmental rules and regulations that half of the time you don't even agree with. And you know what I mean? You, you, you know what's happening on the ground and you can help these children in every single case, the, the ones that are finding difficulty in learning in a real loving environment. But to do that, like I say, there needs to be quite a lot of changes and we need to have leaders who have a passion for that change. And some of you will probably do that. Some, there's quite a number of teachers in our audiences generally and many of you after applying some of these divine principles, divine truth principles in your life will feel the drive to actually create these kind of locations and because you've now not got a law of abundance issue with money and you're not got a law you will create those things in education until that time what needs to occur is that each of us and this applies to every system that we're in each of us need to start looking at living at the truth in the system we're in. So you see, if you live in truth in the system you're in, the system you're in will be confronted. Right? Because the system we're in is usually in a place of error. And if we're in a place of divine truth, so we've connected with God and we can feel God's truth about a matter, what will happen is that we start speaking this truth. We start actually verbalizing what we know to be truth 
without fear, because we, so we'd have to work through our fear, and we do it without fear, and we'd have to work through our desire to condemn, and we do it without condemnation or judgment. And once we can do it without fear and without condemnation or judgment, but still live in truth, we can be in a system and confront it daily. And you have enough people confronting a system, and the system will change. And it doesn't take many people confronting a system for the system to change. Far less proportion than what you might imagine. And this is why it's so important to have this initial change occurring inside of us emotionally first. But does that answer some of your questions about education? Yeah. Some of those things you've already felt too, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, up the back there. <laughs> no, it's not on. Just on that topic of being a teacher, if a teacher works through the law of attraction, the fact that they've actually got into the classroom, they're attracting certain kids that trigger them into their own emotion of maybe powerlessness or frustration or does that change the classroom environment if the yes. teacher works through their own emotion? Very much okay. so. So if the teacher, teacher has an emotion, for example, inside of themselves that they want to suppress emotion of their own. So if they've got some grief, for example, inside of themselves that they want to suppress. Let's say there's a child who's just another little soul, if you like, still developing soul, is attracted to the teacher through the law of attraction. This child starts crying the teacher would firstly need to deal with what emotion inside of herself causes herself to suppress her own tears that this child would begin to trigger. Now as she does that, this child will actually cry in a causal way and release the emotion very rapidly. But if the teacher doesn't deal with her emotion, this cry child may cry all day. Right? Because there's an emotional confrontation happening. So you imagine a teacher, this is why it's very interesting being a teacher, because you've got a classroom of like 20 to 30 people, all law of attraction emotions towards you. Right? Now, a lot of us as parents have problems with two or three children with that going on, right? So if you can imagine 30 of them now doing this, there's going to be law of attraction things happening for you all day. And as a teacher, the, one of the core things is going to be own your own emotion, everything. And by owning it, it means you're going to need to experience it. So if I was a teacher, what I would do, if I can't experience the emotion in the environment under the environment of the education system that it's given me, what I would do is every time I notice the emotion of anger rising me, I'd write that down as I'm, as I'm doing the teaching. I'd write it down, my own emotion. If I notice an emotion of grief, I'd write that down. If I notice an emotion of something else, I'd write that down during the day. And then I would revisit and pray about those emotions when I got home at night and allow myself to actually be triggered by those triggers that occur during the day. Now, once you progress even further, you won't even wait anymore. You won't care that you're going to get the sack anymore. Right? And so when a child triggers you emotionally, you'll just go straight into your tears too. Right? So your child's crying, the child's crying, coming out to crying or doing something, and that triggers something in you. So away you go. You start crying, right? And you cry, and then you're crying, the child's crying. And you know what will happen with children? And this happens all the time with children. When you're dealing with a causal emotion, there is now no longer pressure on the child to conform to your emotional denial anymore. And what most of the child do, they, after, they, they start calming down. And ironically, what happens in most cases is they actually do it quietly, do things quietly until you're done. So in an ideal environment, the teacher would be allowed to experience her emotion. Now when I say an ideal environment, you can create the environment by confronting the system. But you've got to be brave because you might lose your job doing it, right? And that's the problem that we have in the world today is that oftentimes we are not allowed the person in this area of responsibility is not allowed to express their emotion. And so what happens when they're not allowed is that everyone around them gets that unhealed emotion moment by moment by moment. Do you imagine you'd have managers all sitting down working way through their causal emotion? You know, so, so people attacking them so they deal with their causal emotion and you know what I mean? If you had a perfect world, this would happen automatically. It's not a perfect world, but how is it going to become one? It's going to become one by a few of us doing it automatically and showing others what's going on, what's actually happening. And then it's going to become one by people 
in science proving that this actually works, you know, that it's not cognitive therapy and behavioral therapy and behavioral modification and, and all of these other things that work very well. Cause as you know, as a teacher, right, they don't work very well, right? And, and it's this thing that's going to work. But what often happens is nobody wants to look at this thing because all of us are in the state where, we, as Mary said, we want to shut down some causal emotion. And so when we get to a phase where we've got openness into the motion, what will happen is a lot of these changes will happen very rapidly. And this is where, if you want to change the world, you've got to start with yourself. But start with yourself at the soul level. Um, and is it on? I don't know if it's on. Just oh, there it is. Yeah. Hello, Mr. How are you? Um, thank you. Um, I was just wanted to say, I work in preschool, which is Montessori preschool, and Montessori was born hundred years ago, and he was a, she was a scientist, but she wants to help children that observe first, and she allow all the free wills. So we, we make all the environment ready for children. Anything they want, painting, um, door making, or even just not, there's nothing seed. You can go just sit down, have book for one hour if they want to, or just. So there was no real rules imply, imposed mm, upon the children. They, they yeah, were allowed to do what they wanted. To do but we we create the safest right with yeah, a creative play, in a creative environment like books there yeah. and puzzles there if they want a science there if they want a math and some blocks available and even fruit and veggies um ready for them if they're hungry they just help themselves so they're allowed to even eat when they want it yes Awesome. Um, they don't have to tell us. I don't know about you, but I'm impressed by that. Yeah. <laughs> I like eating when I want. They don't have to tell us they're going to the toilet. Or they just get up, go. Go to the toilet. Yeah. Yeah. And if they're wet, off we end, they change. Yeah. They don't have to tell us if they can. Yeah. If they need help, help me. That's fine. We help you. Yeah. And, yeah, and because everyone's free, so, um, children come to our school and s- scream. And then parents leave and go, and then five seconds they smile and happy. <laughs> Once the parents are gone, and they're gone. <laughs> it's yeah. so amazing that I can see all the emotion and all our emotions too. If I'm not good in there, yep. things happen and it's very confronting too. Yep. And last couple of weeks, um, our director has uh, lost his brother. Yeah. And she has a lot of, lot of um, emotion comes up. Yeah. Children screams and So you've got now the children happened. crying and screaming yeah, because everything someone's happening feeling grief. And, oh, yeah. But I haven't told truth about um, about God and AJ. Yeah. I show her your she can't or talk through. Yeah. But um, because um, I'm trying to be open, um, I set it up. Um, Teaching children, if they feel very angry, go and bash some um, mats with the um, dust up. Yeah. So I say, ah! <laughs> awesome. I'm showing yeah. how to do it. Yeah. Two children just come up with me and s- brighter eyes and after he screamed and everything. Yeah. They don't need five minutes, just one minute, it's gone. Yeah. And happiest ever. Yeah. It's just amazing awesome. how they do. Yeah. And yeah, I like being there, but very confronting these days. Very confronting for your yeah, emotions. In the morning, I feel so scared to go yeah, to yeah. work. <laughs> what's going to come yeah. up today? Yeah. yeah, what's going to happen today? Yeah. Um, yeah, I love children, so I'm so happy there. Yeah, but I just want to tell everybody there's a lot of Montessori in, in already in, the, um, United States, Italy, Japan, and here in Australia too. Yeah. 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 So okay. th- there is already a lot of things sort of happening. It's just a matter of understanding what's going on at the emotional level a lot of times, at the soul level that I described. That's really important. Thanks. Hi, 
Hi, Jack. G'day. Um, I have another question about souls. Um, when they're joined and before the in the uh, unincarnated uh, condition. Unincarnated. Yep. Um, you said something about um before, like one soul uh, is born and the other one has this urge. Where do they go before that? Because they're obviously not in the spirit world because then they'll get contaminated or, I don't know. Uh, can you explain the before process? Um, there's a, it's a state rather than a location for a start that's important to understand. That the state that they're in is that they are connected to God as their parent and while they remain unincarnated, they have... Um, and this applies even for the half of the soul. Remember that really in the end, you know how I draw it. I draw it like here's the the soul and I draw it like it splits in half like that, right? In reality, and this is going to be difficult perhaps to understand, in reality what's happening is you're always actually joined to your soulmate, right? And And so... When half of the soul incarnates, the other half of the soul is joined to them energetically. So it's a state of being and not a location of being. And so they will be near their soulmate no matter what. So no matter where you are on the planet, you are actually still joined to your soulmate whether you know it or not. It's about becoming consciously aware emotionally that you are joined as to how it grows. So the truth is that the two halves are really always joined together and can never be separated. They have this, they have the largest law of attraction. But from a physical point of view and emotional point of view, it feels like there's separation. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, that does make sense. Um, But they do have to be incarnated on earth. They do have to incarnate into a physical body. The reason why is when you separ- when the soul separates in this way, there are certain senses that it has as a combined soul that when it starts to separate, remember it's still joined, but there's a, there's a feeling of separation. There's a lot of different parts of the soul. You could think of it like sort of connectors, connector points. You know how you can get uh, two things and connect them together um, like they're one? Like Lego. Sorry? Like Lego. Like Lego, or I would actually picture it almost like an almond. You know how an almond's got two halves, and you split it apart, and it's got that nice shiny bit down the center, and but it, only that almond will go back together with that other side of the almond. You know, you can't put another one that you've just broken up together, and they never fit together perfectly. But if you get that one particular almond seed, split it open, and pull it back together, you can put it back together perfectly, right? So even though they're open, there's this, still this connection between the two. They mirror each other in connection. and But in order to experience themselves, in the case of our soul, they have to be connected to bodies. They have to be connected to a body in the physical realm to experience the physical. And they have to be connected to a body in the spirit realm to, exp- to, to experience the spiritual. And the only time they don't need to be connected to a body is when they're back together again in a complete union, the soul union state, and then they no longer need bodies anymore, although many times they might have hundreds of bodies connected to that point, right? which is another story. But, but what's ha- so what's happening is they need this body, and you can think of this spirit body, right? So here's a male spirit body, material body, or the physical body. There's the two bodies. They are connected. These bodies are really just tools through which the soul can gather information, sensory information and emotional information about its universe. And there is these, I didn't talk about it yesterday, but these, there's these connectors. Um, there's a chord that is well known um, in most circles nowadays. It's called the silver chord. In spirit literature, they, it's actually a silver cord. That's why they call it one. It is this energetic cord that connects the material body to the spirit body. And when you die, that breaks. It separates. And what that means then is that while this cord is connected, you can assimilate emotions and sensory information into your soul. Right? When this cord disconnects, now this body is no longer able to function because it's no longer physically connected to the spirit body or the soul anymore 
And the spirit body then becomes the primary point of sensory input. So this is why when you go into... Um, anyone had a near-death experience? A few people? Okay, quite a few. When you're in a near-death experience, what's happening is you're almost at the state where now this silver cord is breaking. Right? And so what happens is there's this transfer over of sensory information to your spirit body. And so from now on, you're actually receiving most sensory input and most emotional input, even, even sight, sound, taste, everything, is coming through your spirit body senses into your soul rather than your physical body senses into your soul. Now, if that cord snaps, you would pass. If the cord doesn't snap, then you can come back into this state. This is exactly also what happens when people go what are called out of body or what other people might call um, astral travel and all those kind of things. All that's happening there is the physical body is being left as the primary sensory input and your spirit body is now experiencing the primary sensory input. Right? And in that state you can travel in different means of which you can use move this body. Right? And so you can then start experiencing different things in the spirit world. Now, a lot of people experience quite negative things in that state because of different laws of attraction. But some people experience positive things. Sometimes they have spirits with them who will take them up somewhere and show them something. And, you, and as a spirit, you can loan another person energy and loan them love, if you like, for a short period of time to show them something and then drop them back down into their normal state. And so the out-of-body experience even is is... The difference between sensory inputs coming from the physical to sensory inputs coming from the spirit body. These sensory inputs exist, remember I said yesterday there's a superset of sensory inputs on each capability. So the physical body has a certain limitations. When you go to the spirit world, the spirit body has less limitations. It has a greater capacity for, sen there's a lot of more sensory information. And the soul itself, has even more sensory information, and then there's one half of the soul, but the combined soul is an even greater unit that has even more, and in fact that becomes our greatest unit in terms of having the most possible capabilities. And then, if you think of divine love as growing that soul into a big super soul, <laughs> if you like, and so this, su this super soul can grow infinitely in sensory information. So that's the capacity, or that's the future for your soul. So you first go through, you can think of it like you're changing states. You're, what you're doing is you're changing states in terms of a part of your learning experience. So the first learning experience is the material body. When you pass, now your learning experience is via the spirit body. When you get to the soul union state, your learning experience is by that body. And who knows what we can learn in that state that state, to me, is like, I, I sort of feel myself like I'm a baby in that state. I'm a baby there. We're a child sitting in mummy or daddy's arms, ready to be really educated. So if you think we're being really educated on earth here when you go to a university or something, trust me, that is just like child's play, shall we call it. And what's happening in this state, is now you have the ability to learn these immense, immensely powerful lessons and also to become the person that God designed you to be. And from what I've seen of God's designs, this particular state can grow infinitely as you receive love from God more and more. That state will grow infinitely. And I also have this feeling that not only is divine love the only thing you can receive from God, but there will be lots of other attributes and qualities in this state that you can receive from God that you can't receive from God in any other state. Does that make sense? So that's sort of the future of your soul, if you like. Um, yeah, I, I sort of have a little bit more of a question. Fire away um, with the questions. Okay, so I'm in a body and I have all these amazing possibilities of experiences and everything else. Mm -hmm. If I die and don't have a child, for example, mm -hmm. that you know, that the mirror of emotions that I could potentially work through. Mm -hmm. If I go into the spirit world and I can't have a baby there, like I can't have a baby, then how do I 
Yeah, the law of attraction of releasing those emotions. Well, for a start, there are a group of them. If you have a desire, let's say you're a mother, or not being a mother, and there's a desire in you to have a child, and this is like a really burning desire in you to have a child, it's not actually driven by a pure emotion. There is actually a number of different emotional injuries that you need to work, work your way through. The irony is that when you work your way through them, you will probably automatically have a child after that point, right? Whether it's through a relationship or whatever else. The problem today is a lot of times we interpret something as a burning desire when in reality it's actually based on some severe emotional injuries we have about these particular things. Now that's quite hard to hear if, if, if a man is talking to a group of women about that issue. But Mary has personally experienced that um, herself as she's working her way through some of the injuries she has from her first century life. Her, her What she thought was a desire to have a child she's starting to realise was actually an injury, emotional injury to have a child. Once she works through that, ironically, if she still wants to have a child, it will be a pure desire, and pure desires are generally auto always automatically fulfilled. You follow me? Secondly, um, if we pass from, let's say we have a burning desire to have a child, and we're a female soul on the earth with burning desire to have a child, but something unforeseen occurs and we pass. So we're now in the spirit world. Right? You cannot have a child in the spirit world. So, when I say have a child, I mean give birth to a child in the spirit world. So, what you will happen to you is you'll have to be working your way through that emotion of that feeling of loss and the feeling that of regret about not having a child while you had the opportunity in the, in the, or that you didn't have the opportunity on earth to have a child. However, when you think about it, if you follow God's path of progression, which results in the one of the soul, and it results in the, the, the process of reincarnation, you could certainly have a child at some point in the future. Does that make sense? But let's look at what really children are, shall we? Let's really look at what children are. What children are is this. He is God. He is God's children. Remember, I drew them as little souls, if you like. Right? He is God's children. Then the child incarnates, created, attached to a body. Whose child is that? It's God's child. And who is that in relation to me if I created this body? That's my brother or sister. Right? See, this one of the biggest problems we have on this planet, and to be frank with you, it causes a, a lot of issues with families, education, all sorts of other issues, is this belief that my child is my child. The ch I'm sorry, the child is not your child. The child is God's child, and all you did was create a body for it. That's all you did through your desire to have sex. That's the only thing that happened. It is not your child. Stop thinking you own your children, right? Or can even own your children. Now, this is a very important thing to understand because if I stop owning my children and I start seeing this particular child that I created, God's child that I created bodies for. So all, all I did was create the bodies. In fact, I don't even know how I created the bodies. It was just this sex act thing that occurs that I wanted to do. And in that process, the bodies were created. But who knows scientifically how that occurred? Most of us have totally clueless about that operation, so we can't even say that we even created the bodies, really, could we? It was the entire process that God put together to create the bodies that we can enjoy the process of. So these two bodies I created in a very, very loose way. Right? I didn't create this soul, and this soul is not my child. This soul is God's child. In fact, it's half of one of God's child children. Now, 
What's my focus then as a parent? My focus as a parent stops being, don't you do anything to my child, this is my child, getting my child to make me proud, all that crap goes. Right? Because all we're focused on now is teaching this child about God's love for it. Right? And as that child learns about God's love for it, it will learn everything else automatically. And that's how simple it is to bring up a child. Right. But what do we do? We go down this other road. And by the way, in the first century, I didn't go down that road because the time that Mary and I conceived a child together, within a few months I was crucified. So I didn't have that experience. But trust me, in this life I've had the experience now. One of the reasons why we had the experience and chose the experience that we've done is so that I could experience some things that I didn't know about in the first century. And this experience of having children, I've gone down the track for, for the first 12 or 13 years of their life of thinking them as my children, just like probably many of you have. Now I see them in a completely different way. They are just my brother. My, I've got two sons and they are my brothers. And uh, you've seen one of my brothers. Mm-hmm. And he's pretty close to me. Tristan, would you like to stand up so people who haven't met you? There's my close brother Tristan. So Tristan feels himself also to not be my son anymore. He feels that we're brothers too. Okay? And we both feel like we're children of God. Right? So, so the beauty of, of understanding it that way means that I'm not ever now going to impose my will upon this child because this child is not mine. I understand that completely. This child is God's child who I can love just like any other child. So I love Tristan the same amount as I love all of you. But we obviously have a special bond because he and I are on the same path spiritually growing towards God, both recognizing very, very similar things. And because Tristan is growing very rapidly uh, in terms of this, on this relationship with God, I feel very close to him as a result of that. Because anybody who's not growing on the relationship with God, I feel close to. And also because I've known him for a lot of his life and seen the changes that he's made because of the choices that he is making, got nothing to do with me, it's the choices that he is making that is causing him to change. Now, the relationship that I honour with Tristan the most is his relationship with his soulmate. That's the relationship I honour. Because that is the other half of him. And in fact, it is going to be the soulmate relationship that is going to be the only permanent relationship that you will have. And when I say permanent, I don't mean that you won't have relationships with other people that last thousands of years or even hundreds of thousands of years. What I'm saying is that the soulmate relationship is you are both halves of the same entity. So therefore, you are going to at some point recognize that and at some point you'll get to the point where you are combined as one and you will be the one entity. Um, even though you may have two bodies connected. You may even have four bodies connected. Because remember, you, you can be this person on earth. And remember on earth, you at the moment have two bodies. You have a spirit body and a material body. And then your soulmate has a spirit body and material body. So there's two bodies each. So there's four bodies connected to this one entity, the soul. So it doesn't worry about the bodies. We're talking about the soul itself. So... So you will get to the stage where instead of seeing children as yours, you will see them as God's. And so you will also see your role. Your role as their older brother or sister is to help educate them in God's love. That's your role. And in fact, God created the universe to assist you to do that. There is just so many things on this planet and in the universe itself that can assist you to tell and educate your children about their connection with God. 
But the problem is nowadays, we just view it as all uh, like evolution all just popped in the, you know, here by chance and everything. And we dismiss that there was ever even a creator of it all. And we go down this other track of uh, going all scientific and teaching about evolution. And what are we really teaching them in the end? We're teaching them to detune from the fact that they are God's child. And remember I said earlier, how did all of our problems come about? Because the first human couple decided to detune from their relationship with God. And we are reinfecting that choice over and over and over and over and over and over with our children, so-called children, our children, which are not our children, our gods. What happens to um, innocent babies when they die? Do they still have emotions passed on by the mothers? Um, remember I said yesterday that all emotions begin entering you at the time of conception. So any person who passes after the time of conception does have emotions. Um, and some of those emotions can be quite dark because they come from your environment and the environment's emotions are often quite dark. But what happens when a child passes is a little different than what happens when, a, when an adult person passes. And I would be happy to describe both processes if you wish. Yep. Okay, so this is what will happen when you pass. Let's look at the child first. So let's say the child is an abortion or a miscarriage. So in other words, it actually is passed before it is born. The child is picked up, in this case, by a celestial spirit generally, a spirit who's actually on the divine path, and nursed through, until they actually start having cognizance of it, their environment. So the child, which remember is a soul connected to the two bodies, is nursed and also given lots of energy, emotional energy, to heal itself. And what happens is that is nursed through the process into the process of cognizance, where it can actually understand its environment, start to understand its environment, just like a baby. In other words, it's nursed to the point of being a baby, if you like. Now, by this stage, which is usually a period of anywhere up to um, the same type of time that it would take on Earth for that process to occur, what happens is the child also can speak generally by this stage at the, in the spirit world. And the child then is allowed to make a lot of choices on its own already. So it, make, it starts making choices. And where it's located is in the first sphere of the spirit world. Remember I said there's all these spheres of the spirit world. The first sphere, the very first one, has thousands and thousands of planes. At the depth of the bottom of the planes is called the hells, like, which is a very dark, dingy, very terrible environment. At the top of the first sphere is a place called Summerland. And that is like probably the best environment you can conceive of on Earth here is like what Summerland is, right? with some additions. And the additions are a creation of what we talked about earlier with regard to schooling or education, a creation of environment that the child is actually triggered into desiring to have answers. And so the child is actually then at that location after that initial place of, after the initial nursing from, from an angelic spirit. And once the child is in that place, they begin to learn all the different things of the universe. A lot of it's physical, but a lot of it's spiritual and emotional as well. And they're allowed to choose what they deal with. If they have an emotion from their parents still within them, which is unusual by that stage from if they were pre, if they died before they were born, um, they would actually still be nursed through those emotions. So they are nursed through those emotions in a very loving environment. And then they're basically left to have whatever they want, whatever those desires are. And by this stage, they usually have a few mates and, uh, you know, a few friends and they have their own environment set up and, uh, they, they progress quite, quite quickly, um, through that state. And then they're given a choice, a choice to follow the natural love path, which is a path of intellectual development, becoming adult-like, all those different things I mentioned yesterday, 
or the choice to actually follow the divine love path, which is connecting to God and all of that. Now, many of them make the choices they make depend upon what forces start to control them at this point. Now, if they passed as a uh, as a miscarriage, many times by this stage they will be starting to feel the emotions of the mother who and father from which they miscarried. And so they will start to feel some of those impressions upon them as pushing them in a certain direction. And so often they might, you know, if the mother or father is into a different path spiritually, they might firstly start to investigate that particular path. But they're giving completely the free will to do whatever they wish at that point. Now let's say the person passes, but they're still a child, but they passed after their birth. They could be just newborn, and if that's, if that's the case, it'll be a very similar process to what I've just described. If they, if they are a, uh, not a newborn, but let's say they're four, five, six years of age, something like that, and they pass from leukemia or cancer or, or some kind of disease or some kind of accident, then what would happen is that they would still have emotions from their environment in them, but those emotions would be a bit stronger. Does that make sense? They'd be more powerful emotions. And so they would often be nursed through a process of releasing those emotions, which, by the way, in the spirit world, for a child of that age, happens very, very rapidly. So within a few months, usually, they're nursed through that entire process. Now they go to summer land and the same process goes off where they're educated, they do what they desire, and the same thing happens. Does that make sense? So passing for children is a breeze. And it's a, it's a very beautiful process for them and they looked after the entire process. The only time when it's not so much of a breeze if there was an abortion. With an abortion, the child is kept away from its mother who aborted it. And the reason why this is the case is because the emotions in the mother that aborted the child were emotions of rejection of the child. And because those emotions of rejection are very powerful emotions to be felt on the opposite end as unworthiness, the, the, the child is usually kept from going back to its mother on earth until the mother works through the emotional reasons why they aborted that child. And then the child is often reintroduced to its mother. So that's the only time where it's a bit more difficult for the child because the child itself is getting the emotions of rejection from its parents on earth. And what happens is the celestial spirits try very hard to actually stop that emotional projection from entering the child so that so the child doesn't grow up feeling unworthy. Right? And then I'll just continue the question with regard to an adult. With an adult, if we pass, it's a little different because as an adult, we made free will choices. So when we pass as an adult, oftentimes what's happened is we're healed from the choices that were made by other people that affected us, but we are still going to have a whole group of unhealed emotions about the choices we made. And because of that, we go and are attracted to a location. So when we first pass... We often go into what is sort of, you see it in a lot of spiritual literature, where we pass into a place that's not fantastic, but it's not terrible, and it's just like a place of reception. You could think of it, there are, there are whole hospitals there like that you could conceive of on earth. They're a bit different in terms of how they look and everything, but they're basically hospitals to help you get through that first part of transition. And particularly if you're passed with an injury or a, or a long-term illness like cancer, you would be nursed through that. The body would be repaired from that particular problem. And then what happens, once we get to the state where we feel our own sense of autonomy, in other words, we're feeling our own free will to go and do things that we want to do, generally we're shown a mirror. And by this stage, generally, we probably don't want to leave and look in the mirror because we start seeing the other people where we've gone to and we start seeing that they are in pretty bad shape and so we can imagine that if they are in bad shape and it just seems like almost everyone who comes through here is in bad shape, that possibly means that when I look in the mirror I'm going to be as in bad shape as they are and fair enough, usually by the time we get to look in the mirror, sure enough, we, we start seeing ourselves for what we really are. But at this stage we don't understand that it's the emotions that created that. So we don't understand much at all. And we, we only understand what we're asked. So if you ask about it, you'll be told. But if you don't ask, 
often you were not told because everything is based upon the law of desire. So anyway, I pass, I've gone into this state, I now recognise where I am and I'm a pretty dark state and what happens is my soul now feels a draw of attraction to not be there anymore and I actually go to a location in the spirit world that perfectly matches my condition of love. So if I'm a murderer and I've passed, obviously my condition of love isn't going to be too great and the soul will be attracted to a condition in one of the hells that matches my condition of love. By the way, where do you think all the other murderers are? In the same place. So now instead of being surrounded by people who are nice and I'm the murderer, I'm surrounded by all the murderers. Does that make sense? And that's a way of exposing to me my condition. Now, let's say I was a person on earth who, you know, had a lot of sexual affairs, you know, over and over and over again, and I haven't worked through that emotion. Well, I'll be attracted to a group of people in the spirit world who have done the same thing. And that'll be in one of the hills in a different location. And there's literally millions of locations for every single, single emotional injury you could conceive of. I, if I'm in a bit better condition, I've worked through different things on earth, then I'll pass wherever, whatever sphere matches my location. So, so much as my development in love. So if I'm highly developed in love when I pass, then I'll be in a space that's in, not in the hells, it might be even in the second sphere or the third sphere of the spirit world. Historically, there's been only a few people ever that's passed into the third sphere of the spirit world. What about, um, people who commit suicide, is there any consequences for that? Yes, a person who commits suicide is, is acting on two primary emotions. And after I answer this question, we should have a break and then we can come back to your question, Peter, if we, after the break. The, the, the um, two sets of emotions are these. The person who's suicide, firstly, has a whole set of emotions about self-love. And self-love in itself is a huge issue on the planet, right? And self-love is one of the major causes or major reasons why the majority of people do not pass into the second sphere, but rather pass into the first sphere, because of our lack of self-love, the way that we treat ourselves. Now, the suicide, usually suicides, for again, there literally can be thousands of different reasons. And whatever the reason is, will, de will determine, be determined by the soul condition of the person, and that will also determine the location that they arrive in the spirit world. But a suicide, because they have murdered their own body, will always arrive in a state in the spirit world in one of the darker places of the spirit world. Then what they will need to do is come to face to face to the fact of two issues that they face inside of themselves. The first one is why they felt they had the right to destroy their body. And the second one is what emotion or reason inside of them caused them to suicide. And they will have to face that emotion. Now, one of the main reasons why people suicide is because they don't want to face the emotion when they're alive. Does that make sense? They feel if they kill themselves, they won't have to feel the terrible feelings they're currently feeling. And that is not true. When they pass, they will have to feel the terrible feelings that they avoided when they were on earth just before they passed, and they'll have to feel one more terrible feeling, and that is the feeling that they murdered themselves and didn't have the right to do so. Right? And when I say the right, I don't mean they've got free will, they can do anything they want. What I mean is they will go through an emotion where they realise that the body that they had wasn't theirs to take away from themselves. It was created by God, just as their soul is, and... And of course, it's impossible in the end to kill their soul. So in the end, the biggest emotions that a suicide faces is that they don't, is the same emotion that they faced when they were alive and didn't want to face it. And the biggest impediment to their progress in the spirit world is that they often still do not want to face the emotion when they pass. The same emotion that caused them to pass. And so for that reason, until they connect emotionally, they don't progress. As soon as they connect emotionally, they progress very rapidly generally. Right? So again, it gets back to when you connect with the emotions and work your way through the issues. Wanted to say more? 
I just wanted to say that um, many of us have similar emotions even though we don't take our own life. We exactly. spend our whole life um, doing things that actually damage our physical body and in avoidance of our emotions. Yeah. So let's look at the emotions related to smoking, which is a slow suicide, right? So I'm now smoking, I'm paying somebody else, in fact, when you think of it logically, I'm paying someone else to slowly destroy my body and I'm a willing participant in that process. So there has to be emotional reasons that are very close to a suicidal person's reasons for doing that. Does that make sense? So many of us have emotions of suicide in us, we just don't act upon them. And when we pass, those emotions will be just as present in us as they were before we passed. So it always gets back to this one rule. Be open to passionately experience all of your own emotions, no matter what they are. And if you do that, you will always progress no matter what happened. So a suicide has just as much ability to progress as anyone else, but often can't because they have the same avoidance of as what caused them to suicide in the first place. Does that make sense? Yep. And so we can help them here on earth a lot to work their way through those kind of emotions. And a lot of the ways we can do that is by dealing with our own emotions and showing them how to deal with theirs. It's very important to understand that all of these things are based around the laws of God that is the most loving way to actually help that person get out of that emotion. So remember, as Mary was showing earlier, the law of attraction pull something into our life so that we deal with an emotion that will get us closer to God in the end. So let ourselves experience that. Does that make sense? Let ourselves do that. Anyway, let's have a break.